Secretary says he will sign that bill, and then President Trump will declare a national emergency in order to build a border wall. It's a move that will almost certainly set up a huge legal and legislative uproar. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live tonight on the North Lawn with what we know at this hour. It's been changing throughout the day. Good evening, John. <laughs> As it always seems to in these parts. Uh, Brett, good evening to you. It has long been expected that President Trump could declare a national emergency in order to build his border wall. But when the news finally dropped this afternoon, it shook the halls of Congress. As the White House was taking a microscope to the spending bill this afternoon, a stunning announcement from Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. I've just had an opportunity to speak with President Trump, and he, I would say to all my colleagues, has indicated he's prepared to sign the bill. He will also be issuing a national emergency declaration at the same time. The announcement made good on a threat the president had said he'd prefer not to use, but was left with little choice after receiving the text of a bill that fell well short of what he wanted. In a statement, the press secretary saying he was taking the emergency action to ensure we stop the national security and humanitarian crisis at the border. The president is once again delivering on his promise to build a wall, protect the border, and secure our great country. In a joint statement, the Speaker of the House and Senator Chuck Schumer said declaring a national emergency would be a lawless act, a gross abuse of the power of the presidency. The precedent that the president is setting here is something that should be met with great unease and dismay uh, by the Republicans. And, of course, we will respond according uh, when we review our options. First, we have to see what the president actually says. The way it all played out was exactly what South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham suggested more than a month ago. There's some things in there that, that are good for uh, border security and let him uh, march toward uh, filling in the gaps by executive action. The spending bill gives the president $1.37 billion for pedestrian fencing in the Rio Grande Valley sector. But there are also restrictions that the president is bristling at. The bill stipulates that border wall cannot be built in several areas, including the National Butterfly Center west of McAllen. It also gives local authorities in five Texas border towns veto power over the wall. And it puts significant handcuffs on the president's discretion to make changes in spending. There are 354 instances in the bill where the phrase is none of the funds, none of these funds, and none of the amounts are used to place restrictions on how the money can be used or moved around. Declaring an emergency may allow President Trump to move some money around from other departments to add to wall construction. It will almost certainly land him in the courts, but he will be able to tell his base he did all he could to make good on his central campaign promise. The House Speaker said it also sends a message to the Democratic base. If the president can declare an emergency on something that he has created as an emergency, an, an, an illusion that he wants to convey, just think of what a president with different values can present to the American people. White House officials say that their attorneys have been looking at the ins and outs of an emergency declaration for months. And while they do expect that this will end up in the courts and most likely in the jurisdiction of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the press secretary, Sarah Sanders, said today that the White House is very prepared to meet a legal challenge. Brett? John Roberts, live on the North Lawn. John, thanks. Let's bring in our panel a little early tonight with the breaking news. Byron York, chief political correspondent of the Washington Examiner. Susan Page, Washington bureau chief at USA Today. And Tom Bevan, Real Clear Politics co-founder and president. Byron, your thoughts? Uh, well, on the bill itself, the president really has to sign it. Uh, he, he, he gave in during the last government shutdown because of political pressure. The pain got too great. Now, in this case, he would have a bill on his desk. The only thing between keeping the government open and shutting it down would be his signature. There's no way he wasn't going to do it. Now, on the uh, issue of a national emergency, I think what we're going to see here is Democrats are, of course, going to claim that there's simply no emergency. It just doesn't exist. The court uh, challenges will be filed within seconds after the president does this. Uh, the president's case is going to be, look, there are about 30 current national emergencies declared by presidents. Most of them have to do with sanctioning individuals 
schools in countries that are very troubled, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Burundi, Yemen. Uh, but the president will say, look, last year about 400,000 people were apprehended trying to cross illegally into the United States between the ports of entry. And who's to say that's not a national emergency? And that's what he'll argue. There actually have been 58 since 1976. If you look at this graphic, there are 30 that are still active. These are all the national emergencies uh, that have been declared. President Obama had 12 of them, including the bird flu emergency and others. Take a listen to lawmakers on national emergencies. I think declaring a national emergency where there is no national emergency uh, is uh, not good for the president to do. It's not my preferred choice, but I don't think uh, the world's going to spin off its axis. Declaring a national emergency would be a lawless act. I think he has all the legal authority in the world to do this. I think all of us will come to regret this. It is not the right way uh, for the president to try and end run Congress. Lindsey Graham, the most vocal, Susan, saying, I stand firmly behind President Trump's decision. He obviously hasn't done it yet. Word is that Senator McConnell is trying to still try to prevent him from doing it. Although Senator McConnell said on the floor of the Senate he would support the president if he declared a national emergency. You know, it's true that there are other national emergencies. That's not so rare. This is a somewhat different utilization of that presidential power than, than most of the others in history. And, you know, interestingly, uh, President George W. Bush once threatened uh, to declare a national emergency. And it was blocked in effect when George Miller from California uh, used a, a kind of an obscure parliamentary provision that meant that you could oppose it. And if you got a majority of the Congress to oppose, to vote against the declaration of national emergency, it was repealed. It, it was pushed back. And that is another course that Democrats could pursue. Certainly that would pass in the House. It is possible a proposal like that might pass in the Senate because there are several Republicans who have expressed concern. Uh, Tom, our latest Fox poll, we asked the question about bypassing Congress, declaring emergency to build the wall. Uh, it is upside down, uh, this 56, uh, 38. Uh, but if you look at others like by number two, um, I'm sorry, number one, the budget deal that includes money for barrier security and humanitarian aid. Uh, there's support for that. It's how you ask the question, obviously, uh, where the support comes down. Yeah, I mean, this is a risky move on Trump's part in the sense that it does certainly shore up his base and it keeps the issue top of mind. And I think the contrast that Trump likes is the idea that he it's a matter of opinion. He says this is a national emergency and Democrats are rushing to the barricades to say this is an this is a complete fiction. It's an invention. Um, that's a contrast that he wants. The downside is it does. It puts the focus back on a split in the Republican caucus and the media will certainly cover all the Republicans that are going to come out and say, this isn't the proper way to go. So, you know, after Trump got a pretty significant bump after in, in his job approval rating, after the State of the Union speech, in part uh, because of the bipartisan message, I think, he's back to brawling. Um, and so we'll see how this works out for him. But it's definitely a risky move on his part. You know, I, I talked to a couple of people who said that, that part of it was the way the bill was written that it had all these handcuffs and that the funds cannot be used for X, Y, and Z, and that they were trying to move different pots of money around to make at least some part of the wall work through moving this money. And it was pretty handcuffed by 354 phrases. <laughs> yeah. Well, John mentioned that. And there are several geographical restrictions. There, there are parks that you can't put up any barrier parks right on the border. But you know, from a policy uh, standpoint, this may not be a popular view, uh, Trump actually did make some progress here. Uh, uh, the administration has already been replacing about 125 miles of dilapidated, inadequate fence with new, strong barrier. This bill allows them to do 55 miles of currently unfenced area uh, with uh, a new, strong barrier. And that really, arguably, is an improvement uh, in border security. Now, it's not nearly what the president wants. It's more like the glass quarter full. Uh, but on the other hand, he actually made some progress from a time not too long ago where the Speaker of the House was declaring any such barrier immoral. And not too long ago, Mr. Trump tweeted about President Obama, uh, Republicans must not allow President Obama to subvert the Constitution of the U.S. for his own benefit and because he is unable to negotiate with Congress. As you can imagine, Democrats are pouring out 
in their response. Tulsi Gabbard running for president. Every time a president declares a national emergency in order to get his way on a particular issue, the closer we are to a dictatorship. Who needs Congress or the people if the president can make the decision on issues by himself? Very dangerous precedent. That's a little overheated, don't you think, that Susan? May be, that may be a little hot, but here's what Nancy Pelosi said this afternoon. She said, you know what? Republicans are open a, opening a door that a Democratic president will be able to walk through in the future. So when a Democratic president looks at the state of the nation, they might say climate change is a national emergency. Congress won't act. I will. Or gun violence in schools. That's a national emergency. Congress won't act. I will. Now, that is the president Trump may not care about that. He won't be president anymore. But that is a long term risk for the Republican Party. You agree with that? Yeah, well, sure, it's going to set a precedent, but a Democratic president has already walked through it. Obama used his pen and his phone for an executive order that he himself said was not constitutional and did it anyway. And so this is sort of a logical progression. I do think uh, it'll set a precedent, and certainly Democrats will exploit it when they can, but, but we're already down that road. And does the base say the hat tip to national emergency solves the pushback on the bill. Well, Trump's base has thought this was a national emergency for quite a while, uh, before the 2016 election. So they're not going to take any convincing. Uh, but I think the president has to make the case to a larger public that with all of these crossings and with U.S. law basically preventing the United States from immediately returning border crossers uh, to Mexico, it creates a national security issue plus a humanitarian crisis on the border where there are lots of people growing by 30 thousand a month that the United States either has to take care of or uh, uh, release into the United States. We'll have a House vote tonight and then we assume the president will make his decision and announcement uh, sometime before opening of business Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. Uh, panel, thank you. We'll see you later in the show. Meantime, the U.S. wants its European partners to leave the Iran nuclear deal. That is one major focus of a summit in Poland on Middle East issues. We'll have an extensive interview with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo from Warsaw in just a few minutes. But first, the latest on the meeting from State Department correspondent Rich Edson. European governments should join the United States, leave the Iran nuclear agreement, and stop enabling Iranian business. That's Vice President Mike Pence's message to Britain, France, and Germany. Sadly, some of our leading European partners have not been nearly as cooperative. In fact, they've led the effort to create mechanisms to break up our sanctions. The vice president joined Secretary of State Mike Pompeo at a summit in Warsaw to promote a future of peace and security in the Middle East. For the Trump administration, that largely means confronting Iran. There was not a defender of Iran in the room. No country. No country spoke out and denied any of the basic facts that we all had laid out about Iran. Britain, France, and Germany are still complying with the Iran nuclear deal because they say Iran is still complying. They have created a process to help Iran conduct business despite U.S. sanctions. In response to the vice president's criticism, a British foreign office spokesperson says, quote, the U.K. is not and has never been naive about Iran and its nuclear intentions. The best way to address these wider concerns is while the nuclear deal remains in place. Pence says compliance is not the issue. The deal itself is the issue. While the U.S. and allies disagree on the nuclear agreement, the European governments have criticized and worked to address Iran's ballistic missile program and its interference across the Middle East. Brett? Rich Edson at the State Department. Rich, thanks. We'll have my interview with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo a little later in this program. Up next, a former top FBI official says he was in on the talk of a plan that could have removed President Trump from office. We'll bring that to you. First, here's with some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. WDRB in Louisville as a federal utility board moves to close a coal-fired power plant in Kentucky over the objections of President Trump and some state GOP leaders. The Tennessee Valley Authority voted to retire the remaining coal-fired unit at its Paradise Fossil plant by December of next year. The head of the board says the decision is about finances. Fox 32 in Chicago with a legal challenge to the planned construction of former President Obama's $500 million presidential museum and library. A judge heard arguments today on a city motion to dismiss the lawsuit. An advocacy group says the project violates laws barring development in lakeside parks. And this is a live look at a foggy Denver from Fox 31. The big story there tonight, an end to the teacher strike. 
Educators will get pay raises of about 11 percent with built-in cost of living increases and more opportunities for future salary hikes. The deal still must be ratified by the full union membership. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. William Barr is the new Attorney General. Barr left the White House a short time ago after his scheduled private swearing in. He was confirmed by the Senate this morning, the vote 54 to 45. Barr was Attorney General from 1991 to 1993. He succeeds Jeff Sessions, who was pushed out by President Trump last year over Sessions recusing himself from the Russia investigation. A federal judge has found former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort intentionally lied to investigators and a federal grand jury in the Russia probe. Judge Amy Berman Jackson says Manafort is in breach of his plea agreement. Manafort was accused of lying about several matters, including his discussions with a longtime associate the FBI says has ties to Russian intelligence. Manafort remains jailed, awaiting sentencing. The head of the Senate Judiciary Committee wants to hear from former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe in person. This weekend, McCabe will tell television viewers how the special counsel investigation into alleged Russian collusion began and his efforts to actually try to remove President Trump from office. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harridge has specifics tonight. You're having a conversation about whether or not you're going to and vote the 25th Amendment. The Republican Senate Judiciary Committee chairman did not rule out a subpoena to compel testimony from Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein and former Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe about discussions to remove President Trump. I would imagine if the shoe were on the other foot, my Democratic colleagues would want to know about that conversation if it involved a Democrat. Graham was responding to McCabe's upcoming 60 Minutes interview. According to CBS, McCabe confirmed longstanding media reports, including by Fox that he believed Rosenstein was serious about wearing a wire to record the president. I was speaking to the man who had just run for the presidency and, and, and won the election for the presidency and who might have done so with the aid of the government of Russia. May 17 is a pivotal month. Rosenstein was just two weeks into the job when FBI Director James Comey was fired by the president. In response, an obstruction of justice investigation was opened, in addition to the FBI's ongoing Russia collusion probe. I wanted to make sure that our case was on solid ground. In a statement, the Justice Department seemed to stop short of denying Rosenstein talked about removing the president. Quote, the Deputy Attorney General never authorized any recording that Mr. McCabe references. Based on his personal dealings with the president, there is no basis to invoke the 25th Amendment. In a tweet, President Trump hit back, characterizing McCabe as, quote, disgraced and a puppet for leaking James Comey. With the special counsel appointment, McCabe's role was significantly reduced, and last spring he was fired for violating the FBI's code of ethics for lying. McCabe's case is now with the U.S. attorney here in Washington for possible criminal prosecution, Brett. Captain, thank you. Up next, my interview with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Plus, Democrats meet here in Washington to plot a way forward entering the presidential campaign season. First, beyond our borders tonight, Egyptian lawmakers have voted to extend term limits for President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi until 2034. It's part of a package of constitutional amendments, also set further to enshrine the military's role in politics. It will now face a national referendum. President Trump's son-in-law and senior Middle East advisor Jared Kushner says the Trump administration will unveil its much-awaited peace plan for the Middle East after Israeli elections on April 9th. Palestinians have preemptively rejected the so-called deal of the century, accusing the U.S. of being unfairly biased toward Israel. A news website says it has established the identity of an alleged Russian military officer, intelligence officer, who was in Britain when a Russian former double agent and his daughter were poisoned. Bellingcat says the man was also in Bulgaria in 2015 when a businessman there was poisoned. The British government has named two alleged Russian agents as suspects. Moscow denies involvement. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back.
President Trump's doctor says the commander in chief is in very good health. The results of the 72 year old president's periodic physical exam state that he weighs in at 243 pounds, has a resting heart rate of 70 beats per minute, blood pressure of 118 over 80, total cholesterol at 196, and an average temperature of 98.2 degrees. The doc says in the report his cholesterol is a little high, but overall, he wrote, quote, the president is in very good health overall. Democratic Party leaders are here in Washington tonight for their annual winter meeting. And we're learning new information about their presidential primary debates, which will begin in, get this, four and a half months. Correspondent Peter Ducey tells us what's on the agenda. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Brett. The field of Democratic candidates that seems to be growing by the day will have a limit. 20 candidates is the most that the DNC is going to allow onto debate stages this summer. And Democrats will have two ways to qualify for these events that are going to air back-to-back -back weeknights in both June and July. First, a candidate can get in with at least 1% support in three different polls. Second, a candidate can get in by meeting a grassroots fundraising threshold consisting of money from at least six 65,000 different donors with at least 200 apiece in 20 different states. In 2016, Republican primary debates served as a launch pad for the outsider candidate who went on to win the nomination. But in 2020, Democrats say they want to do things differently. It's not going to be like WrestleMania. We, we're not talking about somebody's hand size or their mom or anything like that. We're going to talk about policy, things that impact the lives of the people in, in rural communities and urban communities. Something else the Democratic Party is pushing this year, making primaries and caucuses more accessible. So for anybody in Iowa who might have to work caucus night next year, they'll have a handful of dates. They can go and express a presidential preference ahead of time, while others will be able to caucus virtually. Given the number of candidates, the number of activity, the unbelievable excitement that's out there right now, we are expecting these caucuses to be the largest caucuses in our history. A Fox News poll out today finds that a majority of Democrats think there's either an excellent or good chance of beating President Trump in 2020. But it's still so early, nobody at the DNC's own winter meeting can tell us if they think the nominee is going to be a moderate or a progressive or even a socialist. Brett. And so it begins. Peter, thank you. Stocks were mixed today. The Dow lost 104. The S&P 500 was down 7. The Nasdaq gained 7. Amazon announced today it will not build a new headquarters campus in New York. The company pulled the plug after freshman Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others objected to the nearly $3 billion in tax incentives Amazon was promised in New York. And speaking of taxes, as you prepare your 2018 tax return, it may interest you to know that Amazon paid zero federal taxes last year and zero the year before. Correspondent Doug McKelway is here tonight to tell us how that's possible. Good evening, Doug. Evening, Brett. Amazon has been a colossal success, transforming the retail landscape, speeding the demise of brick and mortar stores, and raking in huge profits. $11.2 billion in 2018, double what it made the year before. But it paid no taxes in either of those years. It got, in fact, a tax rebate last year of $129 million. And that has infuriated many on the left. Bernie Sanders tweeted yesterday our job demand large corporations pay their fair share in taxes so that we can rebuild the disappearing middle class. But it's all perfectly legal. Remember this from 2016? Or maybe he doesn't want the American people, all of you watching tonight, to know that he's paid nothing in federal taxes. That makes if me smart. Paid that's then-candidate Donald Trump saying that makes me smart. Thanks to the tax code, Amazon and many other corporations, many other U.S. corporations, can deduct costs for research and development, as well as profits from stocks paid to executives. For most of its existence, Amazon has been exempt from state sales taxes. And it's able to leverage more tax breaks from areas where it wants to expand. But New York's bag of incentives turned off many of that state's politicians. They did not need our $3 billion. They just chose to try and shake us down for it. 
Amazon rejected New York's offer today, prompting this tweet from Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts that Amazon, quote, just walked away from billions in taxpayer bribes, all because some elected officials in New York aren't sucking up to them enough. It is all a trade-off, however. Arlington, Virginia did win over Amazon for its HQ2, and it expects to reap billions in increased revenues from Amazon's well-paid workforce. Brett? Doug, thank you. It was one year ago today that 14 students and three staff members died in the nation's deadliest high school shooting. An interfaith service was held today at a Florida park near Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. On campus, students served breakfast to first responders. A moment of silence was observed at all Florida schools this morning. President Trump issued a statement saying that he and the First Lady are praying for those affected by the shooting. When we come back, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on the road on why allies are going against America's wishes regarding Iran. This is a Fox News alert. Venezuelan president, disputed president, Nicolas Maduro, tells the Associated Press he will not resign. He says he will rebuild the country's shattered economy if President Trump takes his, quote, infected hand off Venezuela. But Maduro is also inviting the president's special envoy for Venezuela to come for a visit. That is just one of the foreign policy challenges for Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. We told you earlier Pompeo is taking part in a Middle East policy summit in Poland. Earlier today, I asked the secretary about efforts by some European allies to help Iran circumvent U.S. sanctions. Brett, we've made clear since uh, our withdrawal from the JCPOA that we thought um, it was a horrible deal and, and one that was not good not, not only for America but good for the Europeans as well. We've been encouraged them to leave the deal since the very day that we did. Uh, the Europeans have chosen something different, uh, and we've urged them, too, not to uh, disrupt the sanctions regime as it's out there. They've now come up with this thing called the SPV. Uh, I'm very hopeful um, that it'll be what they say, say it is and no more. Uh, we're a place where uh, unsanctioned goods, humanitarian aid, can move through. If that's the case, it'll have uh, nearly no impact on the important uh, deliverable from our sanctions, which is to deny Qasem Soleimani and his terrorist regime the resources to inflict so much terror and tragedy all around the world. So what beyond sanctions does the U.S. want Europe to do on Iran? You know, Brett, they've actually over the last uh, months done more uh, than they had done in all the previous time before. We've began to, begun to have good discussions around uh, the missile program and how we might deny Iran the capability to develop their missiles. Uh, the Germans shut down Mahan Air from traveling. It's, a, it's an airline that is connected to the Quds Force, the Iranian Quds Force, the terror element of the Iranian army. Uh, other European countries have called out the Iranians for their assassination campaign that continues to take place throughout Europe. Uh, these are things that the Europeans had been disinclined to do before, and now they're doing. Uh, I must say, this ministerial that we had uh, with 60-plus countries, we talked about Iran a, a fair amount, and not a single country uh, objected to the fact base. They all understood uh, the threat that we collectively face throughout the world from the Islamic Republic of Iran and we're, uh, we're committed to jointly figuring out the best ways to push back against it and reduce that risk. Is one of the ways to try to sabotage Iran's missile program? We don't talk about uh, lots of the activities that, uh, uh, that countries may take covertly, um, but make no mistake about it. Um, America is using all of its levers of power uh, to reduce the capacity for Iran to build out a missile program. Look, we see what happens when countries join up a nuclear program with the capacity to deliver those nuclear warheads uh, at long. Uh, rocket launches are failing lately. Why, why did the Trump administration wait until yesterday to talk about this former U.S. Air Force intelligence specialist defecting to Iran in 2013? I'll have to defer to the Department of Justice on that. It's a, it's a criminal prosecution, and uh, I just don't have anything I can add for you there, Brett. Do you have a sense of Iranian spies working this way inside the U.S.? Make no mistake about it. Uh, the Iranian intelligence service, uh, both the uh, 
uh, IRGC's intelligence service and their uh, main MOIS, their main intelligence service, uh, are working actively not only against the United States, uh, but working against European countries, working against Arab states. Uh, they are a, uh, a powerful intelligence service and one that uh, our intelligence service that I used to have the privilege to run uh, is working hard to make sure does no damage to the United States of America. I know you can't get into specifics, but I mean, is there a broad estimate how much, how many spies are Iran has inside the U.S.? Brett, if there's one, there's too many. I want to talk to you about a couple more things. One is uh, North Korea. We're nearly six months after Singapore, obviously heading towards uh, Vietnam. Um, the vice president acknowledged the U.S. is still waiting on North Korea to, to take concrete steps to dismantle its weapons. What, what does the U.S. need to see from North Korea to, to, to say there's progress here on that front? Yeah, I think the vice president summed it up pretty well, Brett. Uh, we, we've had some uh, good things that followed from uh, the Singapore summit. We haven't had a missile test. There haven't been uh, the testing of nuclear explosive devices. Those are good things. Uh, but the ultimate objective, the complete and final denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. And we hope, I guess it's only two weeks off now, we hope when the two leaders get together again, they can make substantial progress along uh, that, uh, that objective, which I think uh, the entire world shares. How much does the formal ending of the Korean War factor in? But it's something we've had a lot of talks about. Uh, in fact, my team will redeploy to Asia here uh, in a day or two uh, to continue conversations around all elements that were discussed back in Singapore. Remember, uh, we not only discussed denuclearization, but we talked about creating uh, security mechanisms, uh, peace mechanisms on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I hope the two leaders have a chance to talk about that as well. I fully expect that they will. Uh, we also talked about a brighter future for the North Korean people if we can successfully uh, get the result uh, that Chairman and Kim promised President Trump, remember, he, he made that commitment that they would denuclearize. And so we hope to make uh, real progress along uh, each of those elements of what the two leaders agreed to back in June. But there is a time or something uh, on the calendar that says we're going to wait this long. And if Kim does nothing on denuclearization, denuclearization, we're going back to maximum pressure. Is that still in the cards? Yeah, Brett, one of the, one of the uh, core principles of the Trump doctrine is we don't tell our adversaries what we're going to do. Uh, and so uh, we, we've had lots of conversations about how we hope this proceeds. But I just don't have anything I could say about uh, a deadline like you're supposing. The president's going to say that um, almost all of the ISIS caliphate in Syria is, is gone. Uh, we're, we're hearing what what happens to the foreign fighters in Syria whose countries refuse to take them back in. It's a real challenge. Uh, it's one of the reasons my team's been working now for week thing, Brett. Um, we've got soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines that did good work to take these terrorists from the battlefield. We cannot let them out. We can't let their children have to recapture these folks. It's, it's unacceptable. Uh, it presents real risk to the United States, and the Trump administration is determined to prevent that from happening. Afghanistan, how long are you prepared to sit at the peace table with the Taliban? We've made real progress, uh, not just with the Taliban, but with uh, other Afghans as well. Uh, I think they all have a view uh, that 17 years See if we can't find a means by which we can get a political resolution in Afghanistan uh, that provides the security elements that are so richly needed and a political solution that can ultimately uh, take down the risk that Afghanistan has presented to the United States for now 17 odd years. Last thing, Mr. Secretary. You know, up on Capitol Hill, there's been some recent votes, including by Senate Republicans on Saudi Arabia and Yemen, on war powers, on Russia sanctions. At, at some points, undercutting the president's foreign policy. Is, is this a growing trend, and, and what do you think about it? I must say, uh, the conversations I have on Capitol Hill um, are, uh, in most cases, supportive of what the administration is doing. There's, there's places that various senators disagree. You, you highlighted a couple. Congress uh, on Yemen, I, I must say, I, I'm surprised. Uh, to the extent uh, we prohibit things taking place in Yemen were only benefiting the Iranians. Uh, they're the ones that um, are, have caused all the strife. The humanitarian crisis is a direct responsibility of Iranian bad behavior. And I think as we continue to inform members on Capitol Hill of that fact, uh, they'll come to see it the way that President Trump does. Mr. Secretary, we appreciate